I'm Daniel Tully and Meldenine, and thank you once again for joining me. My name is Lord Aramil, and today we are going to be covering a very interesting topic, uh, even if it's a little short today. Animism, and how almost everyone you know practices animism to some degree. Now, to really understand this concept, let's do some anthropology. What is animism? Animism, coming from the Latin word anima, uh, which roughly translates to breath, life, life force. Uh, conceptually, animism has been around for about as long as humans have had any form of spirituality. Uh, but the term animism has come about in, relatively recently, around 1870s, by Sir Edward Tyler. And it's a very early anthropological term, which it's kind of an umbrella term for a series of indigenous beliefs that maintain that everything around you, all the rocks, all the trees, all the rivers, have in some way, shape, or form a spirit. And these spirits can be benevolent or malicious or just out here, you know, living, enjoying life. Now, of course, this is, like I mentioned, an umbrella term, so it can be used to apply to indigenous beliefs across the world. Uh, through time and space. Animism is one of the core beliefs of many shamanic traditions, which can be found in every continent, amongst almost any culture. Most things can trace their spiritual lineage back to some form of shamanic ritual. Now, when we think of shamanic, we tend to, at least in my own personal culture, uh, we tend to think of Native American spirituality. And this is true. Uh, a lot of Native American beliefs have animism and shamanic tendencies, but those kinds of uh, tenets. But these are not the only people who have such beliefs. There are Northern European shamans, Tibetan, anywhere you look, you could probably find some form of animism. With that in mind, we return to the original uh, statement that everybody you know, and even you, perhaps yourself, practice animism to some degree. Now, this might be obvious to some of you. Uh, you might be a pagan, you might be a Wiccan, and say, of course I am. What's new? Alternatively, you might be of more of a Christian nature, and say, no, no, stop that. But it's true. In the simplest regard, anybody who has ever pleaded with their car to start, uh, yelled at an appliance that wasn't working, is in some way taking on an animal, animistic belief. You are anthropomorphizing an object which scientifically is completely inert, especially if your car is dead, it's very inert, and ascribing to it some power that is not scientifically backed. And this is completely normal. We all do it, especially at least in modern Western culture. And this is perhaps a very important part of the human psyche. 
Tim Ingold in his paper, Rethinking the Animate, Reanimating Thought, posits this. Thus, we have all evolved to be closet animists without, of course, realizing it. Intuitive non-animists have been selected out due to unfortunate encounters with things that turned out to be more alive than anticipated. Now, what's that mean? It means that by assuming that everything in our environment is in some way alive and able to help or harm us, early humans uh, were more cautious and thus were able to survive. <laughs> and those who weren't as cautious were ambushed and eaten, or in some way, shape, or form, taken out of the gene pool. I mentioned earlier that animism is a fundamental building block of many religions, and this is true. Animism, as the idea that everything has a spirit, has found its way into many religions throughout the world, many of which are currently undergoing a revival. Uh, the neo-pagan movement, which has been going on for, uh, it's hard to say, depending on where you draw the line, but we'll say about a hundred years, uh, has seen the revival of many pre-Christian religions, across Europe, uh, across Africa. Let's see, I know that African, European, Native American, and even some Asian uh, religions have all seen a level of resurgence, which, as an anthropologist, I'm giddy, because this is just amazing to watch, as people take these earlier religions, extrapolate what we can, and then try to adapt them to a modern culture. Uh, as a quick aside, as an example, the adaptation of Norse paganism, uh, also known as heathenry uh, by practitioners, has to undergo significant changes to be acceptable in modern society. You can't just stab a person to through the chest with a spear and just pin them to a tree as a sacrifice to Odin. That will get you talked about by your neighbors. However, <clears throat> laying some incense and putting it in the tree that's a little less weird, and a lot less noticeable, and easier to clean up. Moving on. Animism is, as I mentioned, a very integral part. We joke about if you don't want to get up in the morning, then the, uh, the blankets have uh, taken you in as one of their own. Blankets don't care. Uh, blankets aren't thinking about whether you are or are not one of them. And we all joke about these things, and generally speaking, it's in all good fun. But there is a certain psychological desire to anthropomorphize everything around us. That cat is an asshole. The cat's not actually an asshole, not really. The cat's just doing what the cat wants to do. At this moment, that could be termed as assholery. Uh, we might talk about uh, any number of things, attribute any number of concepts to inanimate or non-sentient things, uh, specifically inanimate objects, non-sentient creatures, uh, animism is, of course, part of the human condition, and as such, 
it's well within anthropological purview. Uh, thank you for joining me on this uh, quick intro to animism and I guess kind of a fundamental piece of religious anthropology. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to create new content for this uh, part of my channel. I've been really uh, interested and uh, working on some really new and exciting ideas, but getting them out of my head and onto YouTube uh, poses significant challenges. So, until we meet again, dear friends, I'm Daniel Tulian. Thank you for joining me, and farewell.